data engineering life cycle. Let's talk about this. Who's heard of um, uh, life cycles for data? Just kind of um, a show of hands. So anyway, that's what we're going to talk about, specifically for data engineering. I think there's also a uh, life cycle for machine learning, but we'll talk about data engineering. So um, uh, why should you care? Well, I mean, you work with data, <laughs> therefore you depend on data. But right now, there's some really big trends happening in the data industry. Um, we're seeing uh, simplification and abstraction of data tooling and practices. Um, you know, everything that was hard, you know, 10 years ago, 20 years ago is now very easy. There's, there's probably a solution for everything. And so you don't need to think about low level tooling and practices as much unless you're building these tools, in which case, thank you for, you know, building these things and making everyone's life easier um, who use these tools. You know, at the same time, uh, you know, data and ML engineering, um, I think we're starting to see more of a holistic focus on the, the journey of data and its use in data products versus um, sort of the uh, Tennessee and Hawaii problem that uh, Ben talked about in his last, uh, you know, in the last talk where everything is sort of balkanized, right? Like everything is starting to flow a lot nicer. I'm um, just seeing integrations, um, you know, between different um, life cycles, I would say, uh, data engineering and ML engineering, I think of different life cycles, but, um, you know, they're starting to, uh, everything's starting to flow very harmoniously, right? And this is going back to source systems, source systems that generate data and so forth. I think people are a lot more aware of the life cycle than they used to be. Um, and so, you know, as, as Dimitros mentioned, I'm, I'm writing a book on data engineering. And I think one of the problems of writing a book right now is how do you know what's, what's not going to change over the next few years? Why dedicate yourself to writing a book if, if the material is going to be obsolete by the time it goes to print? And so, you know, one of the things I was really thinking about um, around this time last year when I started writing the fundamentals of data engineering um, which is a book uh, that's coming out in O'Reilly this summer. Um, what, what's not going to change, right? Um, what are the immutables? Um, and so why should you care? I think life cycle is going to become um, more of a hot topic over the next few years. And I think it's very important that you understand the life cycle of data. So let's get into that. Uh, who am I? Um, quick thing, I'm a recovering data scientist. Uh, I've worked in all sorts of data roles since the early 2000s, whether it's ML, software engineering, analytics, data engineering, et cetera. Et cetera, et cetera. If, um, if it's if it does if there's uh, data involved, I've probably done it. So right now I run Ternary Data, we're a data engineering consulting firm based in Salt Lake City, Utah. I also teach at the University of Utah, and I do podcasts, conferences, blog, uh, I'm writing a book as we talked about, and so forth. Uh, in my spare time, I uh, rock climb and trail run and all that fun stuff. So. So this is kind of the uh, generic data life cycle. I took this from a Harvard Business Review. If you, if you Google data life cycle, you'll find countless images about it, right? I kind of like this one where it goes through, I think some pretty universal steps that could apply to data engineering, um, machine learning and so forth, right? So data needs to be generated, collected, processed, stored, uh, managed, analyzed, visualized and interpreted. I would say the last part of this, like analysis, visualization, interpretation, this is a bit old school. Um, a lot of the uh, data lifecycle charts that you see don't take into account machine learning, for example, right? So it assumes that you're just doing um, kind of traditional data analysis and biz and interpretation. This still obviously occurs. It's still inc incredibly vital um, to, uh, to data, but you know, things have changed a bit. And I, and I feel like in a lot of cases, the life cycle um, you know, concepts haven't really caught up, but this gives you kind of an idea, right? And it notices a cycle it, it, uh, at number eight, it goes back to generation because assumably there's a, there's a feedback loop with your data. It doesn't just stop um, at one particular place, unless it sucks and then it should stop, but we'll get to that too. Cool. So the data engineering workflow, I kind of like to look at it as, you know, data engineering sits between uh, um, systems that generate data and then uh, downstream use cases like data science and analytics. Um, really the job of a data engineer should be to get raw data process it, maybe create data models, which we'll talk about in a bit, um, then, then make these useful for data scientists and um, analysts. So da a data model could be anything from, you know, a, a star schema, for example, um, raw tables that would be used for analysis, data, uh, data that could be used, um, you know, for machine learning. Uh, it's debatable whether or not a, a data engineer works with feature stores. I would say that maybe they have a hand in this for sure, since they're generating the raw data um, or the sort, you know, the data that we used for these downstream use cases. but Basically, you take raw data, do something with it, and make it useful for downstream users. That's the data engineering workflow. So let's talk about life cycle. So we're generating data, we're ingesting it, transforming, 
and serving it all uh, along the way or storing it in some fashion. Um, when I thought about things that weren't going to change, the life cycle came to mind. And this life cycle um, in particular came to mind. It shouldn't be that much of a revelation, but when you try and, I, I guess, parse out like what's not going to change, um, you know, with data engineering, um, this is what I came up with. Uh, systems need to generate data. It needs to be ingested somehow. Uh, transformation, perhaps. Uh, I would say that uh, transformations provide the ROI for data. And then you're going to find a way to serve it. And all along the way, you're storing it maybe in a data warehouse, a data lake, um, if, you know, feature store file system, a graph database, any number of storage systems, right? I think that, you know, we're, we're sort of in an embarrassment of riches in some sense for the, the number of um, tools that you have all along this life cycle are just, uh, there's, there's so many of them. They're so awesome, you know, and then you're serving data for downstream use cases, machine learning, analytics, uh, reporting, reverse ETL, and so forth. But what about the undercurrents? You know, you keep seeing things like data management, data governance, data ops, um, architecture, orchestration, all these things sort of fitting in. You're like, where does all this stuff go? Um, and security, security is a really big one, right? So, and, and along the way, I was kind of thinking, well, how do you, where would this go? If you were to put security somewhere, where does that go in the life cycle? And it's like, it kind of goes everywhere, frankly. Same with data management, ops, architecture, um, orchestration, software engineering, all these things undercut. Um, I would say not just the data engineering life cycle, but I, I could make an argument for any data life cycle, including the machine learning life cycle. So let's get into the undercurrents real quick. Let's see what we're doing on time here, three minutes. So the undercurrents, this is, I think, the, the, some of the newer ideas, right? Like it, if you look at what's not going to change, these don't change. Security doesn't change. Because you have better tooling or more abstraction, security still is a consideration. I challenge anyone to tell me where security wouldn't be um, important in data. Um, if you find it, let me know if you want to, to talk about that. So what security really means is essentially access control to data and systems at the end of the day, the systems that are part of the life cycle, you know, or the data um, that moves along the life cycle. But security is the number one thing, because I don't care how uh, fancy your systems are. If you don't have uh, good security, you know, uh, it's all going to fall apart at some point. So the next is data management. You're hearing a lot of stuff about data governance. Um, you know, discoverability, definitions, accountability, modeling, and so forth. These were things I would say that were very enterprisey before, like big companies would, would barely be doing this. And now all of a sudden there's tools and projects and companies devoted to making this accessible to all sorts of companies, startups and so forth, right? So this is, um, I would say another big idea. Data management is um, something I think you're going to just see a lot more over the next um, few years, um, you know, as uh, people start adopting these practices for real. So a really good book, if you wanted to read it, is the uh, Data Management Book of Knowledge. Um, it's a 600-page uh, gigantic book all about data management, but it's actually pretty fascinating to read if you really wanted to dig into sort of the underpinnings of data management. I, I thought it would be boring. Um, I found like data governance is actually a pretty exciting topic. Um, so hopefully Demetrius doesn't pull the plug in my talk now. Um, data ops. So ops in general, I think, is the, another big undercurrent, right? So you're hearing a lot about observability. You know, that, that's the big buzzword, I would say, of, um, you know, the you know, 2020, 2021, and 2022. Um, but automation, observability, monitoring, incident response. These are basically the principles of DevOps applied to data. So um, basically, you know, what you're seeing, I think that the other big trend is you're seeing just the principles of software engineering and DevOps being applied to data, whether that's machine learning, whether that's um, data engineering, same sorts of things, which is awesome because I think it represents sort of the maturity of where the industry is going. Data architecture, um, this is another big undercurrent of data engineering. Really what architecture is at the end of the day is trade-off analysis and how you design for agility and add value. That's really about it. There's no such thing as great architecture. There's only like least worst architecture. So, but architecture underpins a lot of how you're gonna design your systems and, and build them. Do you build it for scalability and resilience or you know, are you sort of attacking on tools and hoping that they work together? So orchestration sort of, I think, undercuts a lot of things as well, right? You're coordinating workflows, scheduling tasks and jobs and so forth. Um, orchestration, there's a lot of action in this space, obviously, with the, you know, Airflow kicked this off. Um, I think democratized orchestration tools, and I have Dagster Prefect and, and lots of other projects coming on the pipe. Um, then software engineering, too. I mean, writing good code, I think, is, is something that is uh, a bit underrated, frankly, in, uh, when you get into data. So, um, you know, knowing good programming skills, knowing how to test and debug, and, and knowing the general software design patterns go a long way. But again, all these things undercut data engineering. Um, you know, I can't think of a stage in the data engineering lifecycle where these aren't applicable. So 
really the big ideas again, it's just, um, you know, uh, think of life cycle. Life cycle is really important. Um, whether you're talking about machine learning, which I know this, this conference is mostly dedicated to, or data engineering. And so it's, um, I think that's, again, I think it's going to be the big, uh, sort of the big trend um, over the next few years is really life cycle management. So um, shameless plug for my book, Fundamentals of Data Engineering. It's uh, available as an early release on O'Reilly.com, raw and unedited. It's not finished yet, but at least you can get some ideas. There are chapters available now. Um, it's coming out um, this summer. So if you have questions, drop them in Slack. And if you need to get a hold of me, uh, here's how you do that. So thanks. I think I'm right at time, actually. So.